So mathematics is the gatekeeper uh, for the STEM disciplines. And for better or for worse, most math departments take that role very seriously. Uh, in particular, I've been interested in, in calculus. Um, again, most of the students who are heading into STEM uh, need to take uh, at least one calculus class. And, and I'm curious, how many of the people in the audience have studied calculus in college? Okay. For how many of you was a really good, encouraging experience? <laughs> For how many was it perhaps not so good and not so <laughs> encouraging? Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. And that's what I've been trying to, to understand. I'm going to talk this morning about some of the things that we've learned about calculus in college. I'll be reporting on some, some results of actually three large-scale studies, each of which have reached at least 10,000 students around the, the country. Uh, the first of these is a study that came out of Harvard, Phil Sadler and Gerhard Sonnert. Uh, they're factors influencing college success in mathematics. The acronym is FIX Math. Um, and then my acronyms are not nearly as interesting. Uh, the first study we did was characteristics of successful programs in college calculus, CSPCC. And the one we're currently working on is progress through calculus. Uh, PTC. Um, despite the large scale, I won't be able to say much about what's happening to students in underrepresented groups, uh, with the exception of women. I will be able to report on some of the things we learned about women in calculus. Um, the, the fact is that the, the greatest obstacles for underrepresented minorities are getting to calculus not necessarily what actually happens in calculus. And then the numbers of students who are, who are from underrepresented minorities in calculus is, is small enough that we weren't able to really come up with, uh, with good statistical insights into what's happening there. But I'm hoping some of the things that, that I can present on will be issues uh, that people in this group will be able to explore. And, uh, and figure out uh, what is happening with students from underrepresented minorities. Are these representative of, of other groups of students? So first of all, one of the encouraging signs about working with math departments is the mathematical community got a big kick in the pants uh, from the uh, President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2012. So this was a report uh, to President Obama uh, engaged to Excel, and recommendation 3.1 uh, was that uh, the nation should fund uh, college mathematics teaching that's not taught by math departments. Um, that got mathematicians' attention, uh, because the fact is they support large numbers of graduate students and large research programs by running these introductory courses. So the first two years of college mathematics is the bread and butter for math departments. And threatening to, uh, to take that away um, really got the, the attention of, of the community. So I'll, I'll be talking about both some of the things we've learned about statistics and also some of the reasons why. Um, I think this is an opportune moment to work with math departments. There are a lot of math departments that are really interested in changing what they're doing um, there are a lot of math departments, as you'll see, that are still very set in very traditional ways. Uh, but I think there are opportunities now, and this is one of the reasons why there are. There are a lot of pressures on math departments, and I just want to, to illustrate one of them. These are data from the American freshmen. Uh, so this is surveying students, usually in their first week in college, and uh, the American freshman asks them what their intended major is. They have to pick one major. And this goes all the way back to 1980 and, and up to 2015. Uh, you see up here the, the number of students who intend to major in engineering. Um, you've got the biosciences, uh, computer science, physical sciences, and, and mathematical sciences. And one interesting thing about this is what happened 
immediately after 2007 is this huge spike in students going into both engineering and the biosciences. Biosciences have been growing quickly, but, but engineering really took off, essentially doubling since the numbers we had in 2007. Of course, we know what happened from 2007 to 2008, the Great Recession. And students pay attention to things like that. This is a good indicator of it. But from 2007 to 2015, 94 percent increase in the number of students coming in as full-time students in four-year programs with the intention of majoring in one of these five STEM areas. Math departments right now are in the midst of a perfect storm. Uh, we're teaching greater numbers of students. Almost all of that 100 percent, close to 100 uh, percent increase means doubling the number of students who are coming through at least Calculus one. They also are less prepared. There are a number of factors that are coming into this. Uh, one of them is that we're drawing on a larger pool of students. The other is that the best students now simply don't take Calculus one. They pass right over it. Using fewer resources, we all know that finances are strapped and at the same time with increased expectations for student success. I talked yesterday a little bit about the calculus reform movement. This was an attempt to change the way universities, colleges thought about teaching calculus. Great ideas back in the early 90s, they did not catch on. I think they didn't catch on because they didn't have to catch on. And now we're in a situation where the way we've been doing things just won't work anymore. So things are going to change. And the question is, will they change for the better or will they change for the worse? And we've got to be involved in what's going on in the math departments if we want to see them change for the better. So want to look at, at a few types of, of, of data that, uh, that you might consider as, as you do your, uh, your work. The first of these is persistence. Incredibly important and something that is much, much too often ignored. Um, one of the, the really eye-opening reports, this came out of Arizona State University. It was prepared uh, for the provost at the time, came out in 2007. Arizona State was aware that there were a lot of students coming in with the intention of being STEM majors, and they were losing a lot of them, and they wanted to know why were they losing them. And one of the things that they looked at was persistence from uh, pre-calculus to, uh, to calculus one. At Arizona State, Students declare their major as they come in, so they knew which students needed to take Calculus I for their intended major. And what they found was of the students who needed Calculus I, took pre-calculus, and got an A in pre-calculus, 43% then never signed up for Calculus I. So the grades were great in pre-calculus but they realized there were serious, serious problems with this course if students weren't then using it to continue on. And if you're interested, I can talk separately with people about what was going on there. Um, switchers, for our first calculus study, um, we were really interested in, in students who came into Calculus I with the intention of continuing on and taking Calculus II, and then by the end of the course had changed their minds. So we called those switchers. And uh, one of the things that was most, uh, most alarming, really, was uh, the difference between men and, and women. So breaking it down by grade, uh, whether they were getting an A, a B, or a C, switcher rate for women uh, was about twice as high as, as for men. Uh, now, there are a number of things that are going into this. Uh, one of them is that, that women are much more likely to be in the biological sciences. Men are much more likely to be in engineering. Engineers have to take a second semester of calculus. Women often don't have to take a second semester of calculus or those in the biosciences. And so that has something to do with the switching rates. 
But even if we look at a, a specific area like engineering, and I think that this is illuminating, um, for men or women going into engineering, if they get an A or a B in Calculus 1, they're going to continue on to Calculus 2. But for those who get a C, there's a, there's a real strong difference. Men who get a C in Calculus 1 and intend to be engineers see it as a road bump. Women who get a C in Calculus 1 and intend to be engineers, it's a serious obstacle. Almost one in five of them decide not to continue on in calculus, which of course means they're not going to be able to become engineers. Uh, we offered a number of possibilities for uh, the reason that, that students might have decided to switch, and then broke this down by, by gender. And uh, it's, it's the last two reasons that I think are, are the most interesting and, and insightful. Um, one possible reason they could say is that they decided not to continue because they don't understand calculus well enough. And among the students earning an A or a B, 18% uh, of the women switchers cited that as their reason, or as one of their reasons, only 4% of the men. And then their grade was not good enough. These are students who were earning an A or a B in calculus one. 7% of the women switchers said that that was why they were switching. Their grade was not good enough. Actually, out of these 10,000 students, there was not a single man who was getting an A or a B, decided to switch, and the reason was their grade was not good enough. <laughs> so there definitely are, are, are gender differences going, going on here. Um, once you account for intended major, academic background, um, what was going on in the classroom. So uh, this is a study led by uh, Jessica Ellis, uh, digging into our data, and then this was, was published last summer in PLOS One, uh, that women are 50% more likely than men uh, to decide to, to switch out of the calculus sequence, um, even once all those controls are in place. We were particularly interested in student attitudes towards mathematics and what calculus does to, to their attitudes. Um, so we surveyed the students, um, usually right after the initial drop period, either the second or third week of class, um, a long survey with lots of questions about their backgrounds and their attitudes. And then we came back about two weeks before the end of the term and surveyed these students again. And a um, number of interesting things, before I get into some of our own results, uh, this is something from the, uh, from the Fix Math study, uh, looking at student attitudes, and in particular, looking at mathematics identity, so whether students see themselves as mathematics persons, uh, recognition, do other people see you as a math person? And interest, do you have high interest in, in mathematics? And then relating that to self-assessment of competence and performance. How well do you do in, in mathematics? And one of the interesting things that the Fix Math group found is that competence and performance is not directly connected to mathematics identity but it's mediated through others' recognition of you and your own interest. So if people believe that they're really good at mathematics, that tends to predict that their interest in mathematics will be higher. Um, we get a correlation uh, of 0.594. Um, it also tends to predict that, uh, that others will recognize them as math people. So this is either uh, your parents recognize you as a mathematics person, or your teachers recognize you as a mathematics person. But then what really influences uh, a student's mathematical identity is how others recognize them. It's whether or not their parents and their teachers recognize them as a mathematics person. Um, we were particularly interested in what happens to these three characteristics in our own study, a desire to continue the study of mathematics measured at the start and end of the term, 
enjoyment in mathematics, confidence in their own mathematical abilities. And what we found was that uh, Calculus I decreased their desire to continue the study of mathematics, an effect size of one-sixth, or a decrease of a sixth of a standard deviation in desire to continue. Enjoyment of mathematics, Calculus lowered that by a third of a standard deviation. And self-confidence, well, calculus decreased that by half a standard deviation. One thing that became very, very clear is calculus one in our colleges and universities is very effective at destroying student self-confidence. <laughs> we, we, we were amazed the students coming in when measuring their self-confidence, it was extremely high. I mean, students don't get into Calculus I at a college or university unless they've been good in mathematics. These are students who've had very high grades in high school. They've seen themselves as mathematics people. They think they're good at mathematics. Most of them actually have already taken and passed a calculus course, usually an AP calculus course, while they're in high school. They come in, and this course destroys them. It's a serious, serious problem. Um, we were interested in what was happening in these courses that might mitigate against these destructive forces of, of the course. We asked lots and lots of questions um, at the end of the course about what had been happening in that course. And when we did a cluster analysis on the kinds of things that students reported, we found three clusters. One of them had to do with technology. So how much it was used, how it was used. Broadly looking, what, what we found was technology, use of technology all tended to cluster together. Either the instructor was doing a lot of it or the instructor wasn't using it. We also found that in the, the outcomes that we were interested in, desire to continue, enjoyment of mathematics, and confidence in mathematical abilities, use of technology had no measurable effect, one way or the other. The other two clusters, the first of them is what we're calling good teaching, because we, as we looked at these responses, we said, gee, that looks like good teaching. So in the order in which they wait, uh, providing explanations that were understandable, helped me become a better problem solver, allowed time, made me comfortable, presented multiple methods, made the class interesting. I, I look at these as developing a rapport between the instructor and the student. Not, nothing really special about this, but this looks like basic good teaching. The third cluster, looks more like active learning, what we're calling ambitious pedagogy. Um, instructor had students work with one another. The assignments were submitted as group projects. Exam questions and assignments included word problems, requiring explanations, giving students problems that are unlike those that have been worked in class, uh, holding class discussions. So th these are active learning characteristics. One interesting thing is the good teaching and active learning turned out to be independent clusters. You can have good teaching and active learning, or you can have bad teaching and active learning. Maybe I shouldn't call it bad teaching. Not good teaching and active learning, um, or good or, or not good teaching with or with, without uh, active learning. Um, and the interaction was interesting. Uh, looking at the interaction on student confidence, uh, what we found was, not surprisingly, uh, that uh, we got on the, uh, the post-survey confidence levels that are much higher if there was good teaching, if the rapport had been established. But the interesting thing we found is that if you've got, if you're low on the good teaching score, but you're high on the active learning score, that actually decreases student confidence. Active learning is not a panacea, not, not if you haven't established that rapport with the students to begin with. Um, so one of the, the interesting results that, that came out of the study. 
I want to spend most of my time now talking about uh, departmental efforts and culture, give you some idea of, of what's actually going on in math departments out there. What we're doing right now with our progress through calculus study is we did a survey in 2015 to find out what departments are actually doing, what they consider to be important, what they don't consider to be important, and uh, what, what kinds of data they're collecting. And, um, and I also want to talk about opportunities to, to really leverage change in math departments. Um, this is an amazing graph that this came out of the fixed math study. Uh, they, they were interested in how effective pre-calculus is, and now this is pre-calculus defined broadly across the country the way it's, it's usually taught, so, so not digging into different versions of, of pre-calculus. But does pre-calculus actually help students when they get into calculus? So, Again, this was a large enough study, over 10,000 students. Uh, they had looked at student backgrounds and discovered that they could actually do a pretty good prediction of a student's Calculus I grade based on what courses they took in high school, what grades they earned in their high school math courses, and then their SAT or ACT score. Uh, you put those data together, and you get a pretty good prediction of how well students are going to do in, in Calculus I. And then they compared students with the same level of preparation who had taken a college pre-calculus course before they took Calculus I, and those who hadn't taken a college pre-calculus course. So the scale down here is standard deviations from the mean in terms of preparation levels. So this is at the mean. Up here, we're one standard deviation above. Here, we're one standard deviation below. Uh, this is the, the predicted grade in college calculus. Uh, the curve that you see that uses the, the black circles, so that's, I guess I should use this pointer, uh, so that's this curve here, shows the, uh, the, the grades um, of students who did not take pre-calculus in college. And then this curve here shows the grades of the students who did take pre-calculus in college. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. For the students who are below the mean, you do see that there's a little bump. It, it's about two or three points on a 100-point scale from taking pre-calculus in, in college. Um, that difference is small, and it's not statistically significant. And of course, what's very dramatic is what happens if you take a student who's at or above the mean and then put them into pre-calculus. We're not quite sure why, but the evidence is there that it actually decreases their performance in calculus. They actually do worse in calculus by having taken pre-calculus first. So, one of the reactions to this, and there is, there is general recognition across the country in math departments that pre-calculus doesn't work. I mean, most places don't realize it's as bad as this. Um, but most places realize that most of the students who get sent to pre-calculus will never make it through a, a calculus sequence. Um, there have been a number of efforts underway, and again, as I said, with the progress through calculus, we were interested in what departments are doing and how well it's working. Um, so we, we got responses from 133 universities that offer a PhD in mathematics and 89 universities that offer their highest math degree as a master's degree in, in mathematics. I should say that for progress through calculus, we are, just for, we are just looking at universities that have some kind of graduate program in mathematics. What we found in our first study is that if you're looking at the two-year colleges, calculus is not where they have problems. That that's not really a big issue at, at the two-year colleges. Also, at the undergraduate colleges, you've got small classes, you've got an emphasis on teaching. Calculus is not a big issue there. But if you're looking at the large, especially the large public universities, which usually are either offering a PhD 
or at least a master's degree in, in mathematics. Uh, this is where the bulk of our STEM majors are, are going to, uh, to their four-year programs. Um, these are the places with large classes. These are the places with, with serious problems about teaching mathematics. So we, we focused in, we're focusing in in this study on, on these institutions. Um, we found that there, there are a number of variations that enable the, the university to teach calculus, at the, teach the pre-calculus topics at the same time that they're teaching the calculus. Rather than backing students up to take an entire course of pre-calculus that's just pre-calculus, not connected to anything else they're ever going to study, that doesn't work. But what has been found is that if you can bring it in and teach pre-calculus topics in a just-in-time manner um, that's somehow embedded within the calculus, that that does help. Uh, one of the techniques that's been used for many years, this is at least 20 years old, is to take a Calculus I course and stretch it out over two terms and then embed pre-calculus topics into it as you're going through the Calculus I. And we found 20 of our universities are doing that. Um, another technique is to offer um, some additional hours for students within a calculus course. So you might have a four-hour course. Students can sign up for an additional two hours. And then they're getting the pre-calculus topics as they need them um, to support what's going on in calculus. So 11 universities are doing that. Calculus infused with pre-calculus. We found a number of places that were taking two terms of calculus and stretching it over three. Because review of pre-calculus topics is not really restricted to, or the need for pre-calculus topics is not restricted to the first term. It often also includes the, the second term where they're doing much more with integration. Um, and then the other thing, just a few places are starting to do this. We only found three universities, um, but, uh, but it's definitely out there, is the pre-calculus course, or a pre-calculus course, is offered to be taught contemporaneous with the calculus. So students sign up for both calculus and pre-calculus in the same term with the pre-calculus class working closely with the calculus class so students are seeing in pre-calculus exactly what they need or reinforcing what's, what's going on in the calculus. So this coming fall, we're going to be starting case study visits to universities that are doing innovative things like this to find out exactly how they're operating measure exactly how well they're working, are students persisting, uh, does, it, uh, does it improve what happens to the students in these classes. So this is one of the innovations that's, uh, that's underway that we're very interested in studying. If traditional pre-calculus doesn't work, what about teaching it at the same time as you're teaching calculus? So I, I've mentioned uh, the, the progress through calculus, we started out with a survey of the departments. This was done in the spring of 2015. Uh, there are 330 U.S. math departments that offer a graduate degree, 178 universities that offer a Ph.D. in mathematics, 152, for which the highest degree they offer in mathematics is a master's degree. Um, we went directly to the chairs. In most cases, the chairs handed our survey off to the coordinator of undergraduate programs, who was really the right person to, uh, to answer the questions. We got very good response rates, 75% from the PhD uh, departments, 59% from, uh, from the master's departments. Um, results of the survey are contained in this report, uh, the PDF is available for free download at maa.org slash ptc. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the data. I also want to mention the report that came out of our first study. Um, so out of the characteristics of successful programs in college calculus, uh, it's called Insights and Recommendations from the MAA National Study of College Calculus. 
In our first study, after identifying the universities that seemed to be doing something successful, we then chose 17 of them and actually did case study visits to figure out what they were doing. We then took uh, our observations from these three-day case study visits and looked for common themes, the places that have successful calculus programs, what are they doing? What can we suggest to others? And so we've got chapters in this book describing best practices in placement, student support services, pedagogical approaches, departmental dynamics, which turned out to be extremely important, um, and the preparation uh, for teaching for, uh, for graduate students. And out of the work that we did with the case study visits to the successful programs, uh, we picked out either seven or eight features. Initially, they were seven. And then we looked at number four, and we realized that they're really two very independent pieces of that. So sometimes you'll see this referred to as the seven characteristics, and sometimes as the eight characteristics. Uh, so we were looking at coordination of courses, but realized that coordination was independent from whether the faculty who are teaching it get together on a, on a regular basis. And I'd like to share uh, some of the, the data that we gathered. In progress through calculus, when we surveyed the departments, we asked them about these, these eight characteristics. Um, do you see these as important? What are you doing with regard to these? Um, and uh, do you think that you're doing a good job with respect to, to each of these? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the data, the data that we've got about how departments use data. Um, coordination of courses and regular meetings, of course, instructors, and then finish up with a discussion of, of active learning in the classrooms. So first of all, use of local data. The question we ask, does your department have access to data to help inform decisions about your undergraduate program? And 5% of both the PhD and master's institutions said, no, we don't have any access to data. Um, what was much more common, about half of them, yes, but it's hard to get. And then a little less than half, yes, and, and we can get hold of it fairly easily. Uh, we asked them which types of data they review on a regular basis. Um, most departments, although surprisingly not all, actually look at grade distributions in their courses on a regular basis. Most of them look at the end of terms course evaluations that the students turn in. Uh, that's pretty common. And then the percentages drop off. Uh, less than half of them actually correlate student performance with, with how they've done in previous courses. Um, placement turned out to be the biggest issue for most math departments. It then surprised us that less than half of the departments say that they actually track whether or not their placement procedures are being followed. Student persistence, we've seen that's important. Only 41% are actually tracking student persistence, exit interviews, and then this is really disappointing. Communication with client disciplines. We've seen that that's a very important piece of the most successful programs. Very few departments are talking, about the, we're talking with the client disciplines about what's going on in their math programs. Uh, collaboration and uniformity. Um, so two questions that we asked. The first, for those terms in which more than one section of this course is offered, what aspects of the course are intended to be uniform across all sections? And then the second, when several instructors are teaching the course in the same term, how often do they typically meet as a group to discuss the course? Uh, what we found is that it, in most places, uh, they have a common textbook for the course. Again, not everybody, um, even though it's the same course in multiple sections. Uh, the topics, generally, the, those, are, those are uniform. Um, schedule of when the topics are covered, that's usually left up to the instructor. 
What I find interesting is that at the, at the master's institutions, so these are largely the regional public universities, even when they've got multiple sections, each instructor is doing his or her own thing. Um, I, I found this amazing course grading. Only 8% have this uniform across all of their sections. Exam grading, only 8% have this common. Uh, final exams, only 22% use common final exams across all of the sections. Um, just, well, you know, the percentages are, are, are low. They, they'd be surprising at the, at the PhD granting universities. But it's one of the problems, if you're working with a math department, that you're going to have to deal with, is that the tradition is, in mathematics, the instructor goes into the classroom and the instructor can do whatever the instructor wants to do in that classroom. That is her or his classroom to do with as they want. And there's very little coordination. Now, the best places are highly coordinated, but there are a lot of places that are not. We asked how often the instructors meet together, so the instructors who were teaching separate sections of the same course. Uh, at the PhD universities, at least once every other week, 30% of them. At the master's institutions, only 8% of them have the instructors meeting at least every other week. 43% um, of the master's universities, the instructors for that course, never meet. So the eight characteristics that I mentioned, for each of these eight, we, we asked, asked the department what do you consider to be very important? Well, actually, the, the options were it's very important, it's somewhat important, or it's not important. And then we also asked them, do you think you're very successful at this, somewhat successful at this, or not successful at this? And as you can see, almost everybody agrees, placement is very important. Um, and there's a lot of discontent with how well their placement procedures are working. Unfortunately, there are a lot of math departments who think if we can just get placement right, there won't be any problems with our calculus class. Um, and what we also saw is a great deal of churn. Uh, Two-thirds of all of the university math departments either have just changed their placement procedures, are changing their placement procedures, or plan to change their placement procedures. Um, a lot of hope that that will fix their, their problems. Uh, GTA prep is recognized as important, and, and it's recognized that they're not doing a really good job with it. Uh, the two that I'm, I'm interested in, um, monitoring data, well, only 40% thought that that was very important. But at least there's a general recognition that they're not very good at it. Um, and then active learning. I actually find that this encouraging. I, I don't think we would have gotten this particular blue bar this high five or ten years ago. So these are the departments who believe that active learning is, in fact, very important for a successful program. And we're now just over 40% of the PhD granting departments. At least uh, the leadership of the department believes that active learning approaches are very important. Are you doing a very good job with it? Well, only about 10% think they're doing a very good job of it. So this means we're looking at about a third of the PhD granting universities in the country who think that active learning is important, and they're not doing a good job with it. I see that as an enormous opportunity to, to go in there. I mean, if we can take that 30% of the universities and have an effect on them, that's going to do a great deal to move the dial on, on the use of, of active learning. Um, we asked them about the, the primary instructional style for their mainstream calculus, and incidentally, these studies are all just about mainstream calculus. It had to be a calculus course that could be used as a prerequisite for further mathematics down the line. 
Mathematics for biologists, sometimes that counts as mainstream, sometimes it doesn't. We did find there are a lot of courses for which the, math, the calculus that a, uh, uh, that a biologist would take does count as, as a mainstream calculus. There also were many for which it, it doesn't. Uh, not surprisingly, a uh, very clear majority of institutions, the, the primary instructional method is, is pure lecture. The way we described it is, is lecture with allowing student questions. So that's the primary style. Some active learning, bringing things like clickers. Uh, this was the, the example we put into the question, um, but thinking also of, of think, pair, share, and other ways of getting some kind of student engagement. 18% said that that's their primary instructional method. Only 3% are mainly active uh, learning, which means a minimal amount of, of lecture. 13% uh, came in other, and when we asked them to explain the other, other the overwhelming majority of them said that, uh, that they're just, there are too many different styles of instruction to be able to say what is uh, the main style uh, that's going on. We also asked whether they were using any active learning in any of their sections. And uh, again, I, I see this as somewhat encouraging. Over a third of the surveyed universities are using active learning approaches in at least some of their sections. So they're at least experimenting with the use of, of active learning. I um, want to finish up with, with some reasons for, for optimism. I started out mentioning the, uh, the President's Council of Advisors report and uh, its condemnation of math departments. And as a direct result of that, a number of leading research mathematicians put together an effort to promote active learning and better teaching and use of data uh, in math departments. So this is a, an effort that was spearheaded by Philip Griffiths at the Institute for Advanced Study, Ori Treisman at UT Austin, Eric Friedlander at USC, and Mark Grain at uh, UCLA. So they're all very highly respected. Um, they got uh, serious funding from the Carnegie Corporation and also additional funding from Sloan and from the National Science Foundation. And I've just highlighted some of the key phrases in their, their mission statement. Uh, they're looking for an inclusive movement, mathematically rich and relevant education for all students, identifying innovative practices, advocating for innovation, implementing and scaling effective practices. Um, Tipsy Math, Transforming Post-Secondary Education in Mathematics. Uh, the acronym is a little strange, but uh, um, they've been very good at bringing together research departments especially, not exclusively research departments, but research departments, and getting them excited about bringing in active learning approaches. I think part of the reason that we've got 40% of the research departments acknowledging active learning as important is at least partly due to the efforts of, of Tipsy Math. And in fact, in, in two weeks, they're going to be having another meeting. They hold conferences about every six months bringing in chairs and, and other senior leadership from departments uh, to look at how they can improve what's going on in the undergraduate programs. Um, another report that you might want to be aware of is what's known as the Common Vision Report. Um, so this was put together by five of the main professional societies in the mathematical so sciences, the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges, the American Mathematical Society, the American Statistical Association, the Mathematical Association of America, and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And they came out for, with, with this report. Uh, you can download it from the maa.org site, and rather than giving you the URL, just go to that site and search for Common Vision. Um, and it talks a lot about what the societies are doing to promote active learning, to promote modeling in classes, uh, to reinvigorate what's going on in the, the first two years. And then uh, I have just taken over the position as, as director of the Conference Board of the Mathematical Sciences, and one of the things that encouraged me to take on this role is that the professional societies in mathematics 
recognize the importance, at least at the, the top society level, of using active learning in undergraduate and also in high school, K-12 more generally, uh, mathematics. But the presidents of the societies this past summer came together with this common statement. That this is the, the main quote, uh, but the full statement is much longer, including many references. So we call on institutions of higher education, mathematics departments and mathematics or faculty, public policy makers, funding agencies to invest time and resources to ensure that effective active learning is incorporated into post-secondary mathematics classrooms. Um, this was signed on by the presidents of the five societies that I mentioned before, together with 10 other professional societies, such as um, uh, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, National Council of Supervisors of Mathematics, uh, the Association for Women in Mathematics, the National Association of Mathematicians, and so on. So that brings me to, to the end of, of my slides, but uh, I see that I've, I've got some time left, and I hope that we can get some questions and discussion going. So thank you. Okay, so David has left his time. <clears throat> this is um, a, really a great example of the, uh, if you think of that hierarchical system that I put up with the circles of moving from individual students to class to departments and institutions and what we've learned from a very intense analysis of the data available. So uh, David, thank you very much for that. Let's, let's go to questions. So. Thank you. Uh, um, the beautiful diagram that you, you have for uh, pre-calculus yes. and the calculus one. So what is the main reason to cause the, the differences uh, on the uh, positive variation part? Um, yeah, we, we don't really know why the students who, take, who, who are above the mean taking pre-calculus they actually wind up doing worse when they get into calculus. Um, what one can speculate that having been forced to back up may destroy some of their motivation for studying cal calculus, some of their, their interest in mathematics, um, but it's, it's pure speculation. We have no idea what's actually going on there. Um, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering, prior to they take a, any pre-calculus or calculus, so do you have uh, any background information regarding their academic capacity before they take a pre-calculus on the one? So I, I would assume that if we can make the claim that the pre-calculus doesn't work, only if these two groups have a similar academic performance. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the thing about this, um, uh, the graph that I had there. Um, what we've done is, uh, again, looking at preparation in terms of what courses they took in high school, what grades they earned in those courses, and their SAT or ACT scores. And what we did was, or what rather Phil and, and his group did, uh, was to actually compare students who were at the same level of preparation, same predicted level, um, how they did if they took pre-calculus or if they didn't take pre-calculus. Good morning. Excellent presentation. Um, my question, I know you didn't focus on underrepresented groups, and you, did, you only talked about those at the higher education or higher, uh, uh, the peer one, tier one um, institutions. But my question, or not my question, but my comment is um, looking at going back and then looking at those that are secondary and secondary education who had the calculus already, who were their role models? Because speaking for myself personally, I took calculus one my first semester in college as a chemistry major. 
But also in high school, all four of my math teachers were female, and three of the four were hidden figures. Yeah. So I saw myself. So I've never been intimidated by math because I saw myself. So another thing to look at in the future, I would hope, would be who were the role models for the students that did well, even if they took the pre, they didn't take the pre calc they started out in calculus. Yeah, I, I think the, the one thing that, that connects to that is the, the diagram that I showed that a student's self-image as a math person is really shaped by how their parents and teachers see them as a math person, and, and especially their teachers. One of the things that we did see um, was that uh, we, we found that, that African-American Hispanic students are much less likely to be recognized as a math person by their teachers than white students. Okay, other? Did you look at all at the title of the people doing the teaching? Like whether they were adjuncts, whether they were tenured or untenured, whether they were just instructors, and whether that had any influence in students? Yeah, yeah, we, we did uh, for both of the studies. We were not able to come up with, with a clear connection between the, the status of the instructor and, and how the students did, unless the instructor was a graduate student. If the instructor was a graduate student, that was not good. <laughs> um, we, we did in the most recent study, now, now there, there are exceptions to that, uh, because th there are places that are doing a great job with graduate students, but they've got to invest a lot of time and effort in preparing those graduate students. You know, one of the premier programs around the country is at the University of Michigan. For a quarter of a century, they've been doing an excellent job of preparing their graduate students to teach calculus. But it's, it's real intensive. I mean, you know, they, they've got mentors, they've got regular visitors that are, are visits by the, the faculty. Uh, they've got a long training period in the summer. They've got weekly meetings and discussing what's coming up. I mean, it's, it's real intensive. You don't just let graduate students loose in the classroom and, and expect anything good to, to come of it. I had a follow-up on uh, a question. Um, I noticed, uh, you, I found it interesting that uh, you, caught, you said that if in departments where people don't meet regularly and the courses are not closely coordinated, that you have less success. Yes. And my question is, I'm a, as you know, I'm a community college teacher, and uh, we have a lot of adjuncts. And there are these you know, fly, uh, freeway flyer, <laughs> flyers, as yeah. they call themselves, moving from one college to another. So, so as a result, there's a lack of cohesion, and we cannot expect them to come to meetings. Yeah. So we are, you know, it's, we're trying to change the dial on that. But is, is, again, is that something you looked at in many of these big state universities? Are there a lot of lecturer positions who come in temporarily and teach, and therefore that was the reason they couldn't meet often? Yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of lecturer positions. In fact, we, we found in, in our most recent study, uh, we did ask about who usually, what, which are the groups of people who frequently teach your calculus? And, um, at the research universities, about two-thirds of them said that it's frequently teaching faculty. Now, fortunately, at most of these places, the teaching faculty are, are on more or less continuing contracts. And so we didn't see a problem when there were continuing contracts. Uh, the problem, of course, is with adjuncts who come in and teach a course or two and then leave. We don't actually have data on that, but I know uh, there have been other studies that have shown that that, that type of instructor is much less effective, and I would expect it, uh, because we saw that the best programs are requiring people to come together. So if you have adjuncts, ideally, um, you're paying them to come in and meet with the other instructors and, and talk about what's going on. I realize that's difficult to do, but it's something that, that should be done. Um, just on that point, 
Uh, what about at, di at distance meetings? I mean, there's many now techniques in which you could have instructors for courses. You set a time and say, this is when we're doing it online. Here's the software to do it, Skype. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like a good idea. But yeah. that's actually linked to contracts, too. Yeah. I mean, you have to be willing to pay adjuncts for their time. Exactly. Because they're only paid for their time in class. Right. That, that leads to my question in terms of, did you, did you look at like computer software systems like Alex, uh, MyMatLab, um, WebAssign, and maybe online calculus courses? We, we didn't dig into uh, to, to the use of, uh, of things like Alex or, or WebAssign. Um, the initial study that we did, uh, the characteristics of successful programs, what we found was that use of technology all tended to load together um, and didn't have, at least on the outcome variables that we were looking at, confidence or interest or desire to continue, that there wasn't a discernible effect looking at that entire cluster. Um, with, our, with our new study, with the case studies that we'll be starting this fall, we're hoping to dig into the use of that kind of technology and find out who's doing it effectively and how are they using it to make it effective. Oh, um, you know, um, going back before pre-calculus, you know, and I, I really like the next generation science standards because they uh, talk a lot about using mathematics and computational thinking. And a lot of it's built around modeling. So I want your viewpoint on modeling to kind of put some some meat around the calculus coconut, um, you know. So, because with modeling, you know, it, it helps students organize their thinking, and you know, students can, uh, and then you can assess how the students uh, think about change over time, which is yeah. calculus. So, yeah. No, mo modeling is extremely important, and and part of active learning and getting students to actually engage with the mathematics and figure out how to use things, how to use the mathematics that they've learned in unfamiliar situations. The, the, pers the, the group that's really pushing this very strongly is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And you may want to go to their site, uh, siam.org, and uh, I'm sure you can easily link into the reports that have been coming out of that society on how to use ma uh, modeling in, in courses. Um, I, I see that as, as one piece of promoting active learning. Um, okay, one more. And then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. um, so I know that I've seen a couple studies that show that there's a difference when you look at active learning between students confident in their learning and students' scores, like their ability. Like sometimes if they're challenged, they feel less confident, but they know the material better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of that comes to the, the bias and all these other things. Um, so it seems like you've measured on both metrics, but have you compared those metrics to each other to tease apart whether some of that difference in like effective active learning is just perception? Yeah, um, so the first study that we did only looked at affect. So it only looked at, at things like confidence. Um, what we're going to be doing with the case study visits that start this fall is actually looking at other measures of, of student ability. So we'll be doing some content assessment. Uh, we'll be looking at persistence rates. Uh, we'll be looking at performance in subsequent courses. And so we'll be get able to get a, a better picture of the effect of active learning. But uh, for the initial study, we were only looking at, at student attitudes.